Welcome back to Newsmaker Live with me, Kendall Burton. Our guest this evening, the political leader of the United Workers Party, Mr. Alan Shasti. We were discussing a number of the issues affecting St. Lucia. Um, before the break, we were talking about the impact of Petro Caribbean, or potential impact of our involvement in uh, Petro Caribbean, Alba. Um, I want to talk to you about unemployment. The International Labour Organization is predicting that over the next decade or so, we're going to have to produce globally 600 million jobs, 200 million to address the current unemployment level, and um, the additional 400 or so coming out every year out of the school system. Uh, so globally, unemployment is a problem. Locally, it's a significant issue, um, one that the United the Social Labour Party won the last election um, promising to solve or to address. Um, we've had a situation where we heard this morning from your uh, colleague, Leonard Montoot, almost a quarter of the population, the working population, um, unemployed. What are some of the, the policies that a United Workers Party government um, would bring in to address the problem of unemployment? Um, one is clearly identifying some core areas for economic growth. Mm -hmm. um, areas of agriculture, mm -hmm. areas of tourism, offshore financial services, mm -hmm. um, and general retail, and then also construction. I mean, these are all significant areas that we believe that there is potential growth. When you look at the um, Quadrant Economic Plan, that was laid out by Sir John. Um, it's one that I very much believe in. So mm -hmm. it's the, the most critical capital input that we have in this country mm -hmm. is, is land. I know that people think it's labor. Labor mm -hmm. is very, very important, mm -hmm. okay? But I say it's land because it's the one that we can't create any more of. Mm -hmm. I mean, so for instance, if you in fact grow your economy to the point that you need to Im import labor, you can do so. Mm -hmm. There are other people in the OECS, there's people in the CARICOM, and if you need to go outside. Mm -hmm. If in fact you grow and you need more capital, more cash, there is lots of money available in the world that you can attract there. Mm -hmm. But if you keep doing well, the one thing you cannot create any more of is land. Mm -hmm. And then th it's the land that creates the conflict. So if you become overly successful, it starts diminishing the returns to other people in other aspects. So there are people who would rather see St. Lucia remain a bit more undeveloped and stay green. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who want to enjoy the ocean. Um, there are people who are concerned about deforestation. Right. We've got to take all those issues in place. So it means that you, there's not an, you can't use all the pieces of land. And then also from a sustainability perspective, you can't develop all your land. So for instance, when we had bananas and we were cutting down the forest, there was a, a heavy price to be paid in desiltation and what was happening with our rivers and the sustainability of water mm -hmm. uh, in our country were all jeopardized because we were growing too fast, mm -hmm. okay? So we've got to put a proper land use plan in place in terms of what we're gonna do. And we need to establish some very clear benchmarks on the pieces that we've identified for economic development mm -hmm. to ensure that those pieces of lands maximize that. So uh, in, in tourism terms, what we look at is the uh, economic rate of return per acre. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to sit down with the naked eye and even looking at general numbers and compare one hotel to another hotel. But all of a sudden, when you start looking at it from an, from an economic impact, how many people do they employ per acre? Mm -hmm. How many, what's the revenue that they're generating? What percentage is foreign exchange? Um, uh, what is their coefficient for buying locally? Mm -hmm. So you have some hotels that make their uniforms locally, make their sheets locally, make their drapes locally, mm -hmm. um, you know, have farmer programs, and you have some hotels that don't do that. So the other thing then is, is the value of that land as, as another input. So if it is a piece of land in which government has put water, sewage, mm -hmm. electricity, roads, and there's a huge support network around it, then you would expect to have a greater level of return versus a piece of land that maybe is on the East Coast as an example, mm -hmm. in which the developer has to put all those things in themselves. When we did that model, there were some hotels that really stood out very clearly as being unproductive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, a classic one would be the Rex property. Here you have a prime piece of land in which the occupancy is low, um, the r average rate that they receive is low, the number of people they employ on a per room basis is low. Mm -hmm. So for instance, under our government, when they applied for incentives, we said, we'll only prepare to give you incentives if you can generate a $350 rate, you can produce at least a 75% occupancy. Okay. 
okay? And you have to show us how you're going to do that. Because an incentive is not something that everybody is just entitled to just like that. You have to show that there is going to be an economic return to us in providing those incentives. Mm -hmm. So the same thing then applies for your manufacturing sector. A, a, a manufacturer that is running a shop, so whether it's the Boulez, whether it's Heineken, whether it's the distillery, um, wh whoever is running a factory, a factory potentially can run three shifts a day. Mm -hmm. And let's say six shifts a week, I mean six days a week. You assume one day down for maintenance, right? How many of our factories are running 18 shifts? Mm -hmm. And if they're not running 18 shifts, then what can we do to meet with those companies to determine where the shortfalls are and how we can help them to meet that number. So in many cases, it's going to be in the export market. And what's taking place right now, there's a huge imbalance of trade between Trinidad and us and even us with some of the other islands. Okay. We've got to get those things resolved. Now, a little business person, that's too big of a problem for them to resolve by themselves. The successful countries in the world have public sector funds and people supporting specifically those things. So mm -hmm. when I talked about earlier about taking a big problem mm -hmm. and now bringing it down into smaller components, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Okay? Mm -hmm. In farming, there are products that we're not going to be successful in producing. And if we are to eliminate probably the biggest problem that we have in farming, is farmers not getting paid mm -hmm. um, and seasonality. Mm -hmm. So for a hotelier, a hotel is open 365 days a year and it needs the same products 365 days a year. It, the, the, the quantum of the product will change based on the occupancy, right. right? But the product itself will not change, right? You cannot have a situation in which we can only produce product on a seasonal basis because it means you're always then going to be dependent on importing. And then how do you marry that policy? And so for me, it's, and it's, we talked about creating a marketing board in which it would be a public sector, private sector owned um, entity in which the quantum of goods that we're consuming, CFL, which is a huge uh, supplier, knows pretty much the seasonality of what they need. Mm -hmm. The hotels within three months know pretty much what the occupancy is going to be. So in terms of, 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 of the demand that's there, it's easy to be able to calculate. And it's then to issue contracts to farmers. Now, the agricultural extension officers, in my mind, should rate the farmers by their ability to deliver the quality, deliver on time, and deliver in the price. So that for the first time, the farmer will get a contract in which he will know or she, what they're going to supply, what the quality needs to be, and what price they're going to get paid. So when they go to the bank and they say, okay, I've been graded as a grade aid farmer by the yeah. by, by Ministry of Agriculture, and here's the contract from the marketing board for these products, the bank knows what they're lending. If the person's a grade B farmer, then the bank knows that they can lend the money, but they've got to be a little bit more vigilant with how they're lending the money mm -hmm. to ensure that the thing is being done. So the farmer then brings his product in, he gets paid immediately. The same marketing board then is dealing with CFL, is dealing with the, with the hotels, and gives them the 30-day terms that they normally would, would want to have. So we have got to make farming and agriculture more business-like and eliminate a lot of the wastage we have and focus on what it is. But clearly, greenhouses and hydroponics are going to be a huge solution moving forward. Yeah. Which means what? It means that it's more capital intensive, more money, and the education level to be in farming is going to raise. And that maybe the, 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 the size of the farms have to change in order to reach the economies of scale to make this thing work, mm -hmm. right? But similarly, we've got to keep growing the economy so there's a demand. And then we have to find byproducts. I mean, it's amazing to me at this point that we still don't have an agro-processing plant where mangoes, you know, guavas, uh, green app, golden apples, all the products that we have that, which are seasonal and there's nothing we can do to change the seasonality, um, that we cannot process them into jams. Mm -hmm. And that as St. Lucia grows as a tourism industry and the significance of the brand that we came up with was to come with a singular brand and that that brand signifies excellence will then apply to the byproducts. So if we're doing jams, if we're doing juices, concentrated juices, all those kind of things. Um, when I was putting together a plan for Souffre, it was really based on a very holistic plan. 
what is it that Sufer offers that nowhere else offers in St. Lucia, and also similarly does not offer anywhere else in the Caribbean? We had a drive-in volcano. And what was the point of that? Is we had um, the potential to become one of the best spas in the world. And if you developed the Sulphur Springs as a major spa, all of a sudden small hotels can develop and not have to be on the beach. You had the copper factory. What was the importance of keeping the copper factory alive? One, yes, jobs. But two, coconut oil is a, a become a very um, uh, important product for healthcare, mm -hmm. whether it's for skin lotions and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So there was a complete tie-in in terms of making Sufra the health and wellness center of St. Lucia and also of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Then you have cocoa. We used to produce once upon a time almost 500 tons of cocoa. We're down to 30 or 40 tons. Hotel Chocola has come in. I think it's a fantastic project in which you have a hotel development, you have um, agriculture in that they're now revitalizing our cocoa, and also in they're now in the process of building a cocoa factory. Um, cocoa, the tree that they're now producing, instead of five years before it starts yielding, it's two years it can start yielding in. And also you have intercropping. So cocoa is a very strong rooted tree. So when you have hurricanes and everything else, the desilting, de de is it, it acts as a preventive for that. The other thing is, is that the, co the price of cocoa and the quality of the cocoa that we have, because of the quality of the cocoa we have, are rising right. significantly every year. So here's a product that we don't need protectionism. Right? This is a product that we can stand on our own. And I think that that's where we should be, we we should be, be focusing, on, 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 on businesses which do not require favorable terms of trade with others. So you're, you're growing at somebody else's discretion. So for instance, when we did the apparel industry, mm -hmm. it required that we had a quota. Right. If we didn't have the quota, we weren't going to be successful because we were considerably more expensive than anybody else. Our tourism product has been more resilient than everybody wants to give it credit for. I believe there are culture products that we can produce here for our tourism industry, which um, people are going to be willing to pay the extra amount of money. Solutions are not as yet, but foreigners will be willing to pay that. So people are willing to pay for fresh lettuce that's organic mm -hmm. and for cucumbers and for tomatoes. And there's a whole bunch of products that we can get into that we can be competitive in. So the linkage into agriculture, tourism, your manufacturing sector. One of the projects that we started that I'm really amazed that the government has stopped was the project that we had done with the cruise lines um, for uh, training. Monroe College, and it could be any institution, but mm -hmm. Monroe College uh, took up the cause. And they were training people for 3,500 EC dollars, mm -hmm. giving them a six-month course. And then the cruise lines were coming down and recruiting these people. So the huge reversal here was that people were only being recruited if, in fact, they'd worked for five years. Mm -hmm. So this was working against the, the hotel sector. So, so you would train somebody for five years. As they're getting fully productive, they were gone. Right. Here was an opportunity to take somebody straight out of high school, send them to the cruise ships. And, and for me, going on the cruise ships was like university. Mm -hmm. You're going to be in the UN because there's everybody of every nationality right. there. Um, it is considered to be world class in terms of the standards. Mm -hmm. So that means that the person is getting an education and getting paid, and which a lot of people here cannot afford. Only one third of our people are going to tertiary level education. Mm -hmm. So here's an opportunity where they could have honed in their skills, come back here, and made a more meaningful contribution. So all of a sudden you have people entering into our workforce that have gotten incredible training from this industry. And it would be a huge relief. Av. We had estimated that we felt that they could generate almost 800 jobs a year. Um, we had already started, we were producing, I think, two or 300. We had some hiccups in terms of the bank loans and everything else, right. um, and also in terms of the minimum requirements that they needed. So some people were coming with locks, they didn't want people with tattoos. And as we were developing the program, we were just going to start turning the thing. The, the plug has been pulled. Mm -hmm. Now, I would have thought that that would be a program that the government would want to continue, simply because these are jobs outside of St. Lucia, and in an, in an industry that is continuing to grow, and, and there's a huge demand for a labor force from mm -hmm. the Caribbean. So there are a lot of programs that we would get involved in. Housing, you know, the, the need for low-income, middle-income housing is huge in St. Lucia. But it's not going to happen on a sustainable basis until we turn around the economy and people can afford to pay for the housing. Now, you mentioned a couple of things. Economies of scale, mm -hmm. um, exports, um, 
trade imbalances. Mm -hmm. I want to tie that into the recent visit by this delegation headed by the Prime Minister to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that he um, did, the Minister of Commerce was there, Emma mm -hmm. Hippolyte, mm -hmm. and one of the things that she came back to report was that they met with um, high-level officials in Taiwan, mm -hmm. um, business officials as well, looking at the possibility of getting Taiwanese investors um, to come to see in Usha. Um, and for businesses here, um, similarly, to go to Taiwan to explore potential opportunities there. Um, my issue is, do we have the capacity, especially net of her statement that they're going to use Taiwan as a gateway to Asian markets to meet the demand in those markets? And how do we go about uh, creating that capacity? Well, I'm, I'm certainly not going to criticize any attempt to try to create new markets for us. Mm -hmm. But I'm a pragmatist, right? right? And I would say to you that, I, I, I'm, first of all, I, I want to really applaud the, the now government mm -hmm. for what appears to be a change in attitude about Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And I think that in recognizing that uh, there is much more to be gained, I believe, in a relationship with Taiwan, not to take away anything from what China can potentially do. Mm -hmm. But in terms of following a development style, I see a lot of opportunities in Taiwan. So, for instance, the things I was talking about in supporting the manufacturing sector, mm -hmm. they have an, a research division that's completely funded by government yeah. that does all this market research, technology research, and they give it for free mm -hmm. to their businesses to allow their businesses to be more competitive. Um, there's over a million Taiwanese living in North America. I think that that's the first opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Um, in terms of drawing their investment here, it may not necessarily be so much to get access into the Asian market because of transportation costs and everything else that might be difficult, but in accessing our market. So let's look at one simple project, the orchids. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. We pass it by every day, and I'm not so sure everybody really clearly understands the opportunity for that business to grow. Right. We're selling an orchid here, I think it's 25 EC. Mm -hmm. You can sell that same orchid in Martinique for 30 or 40 euro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're talking about, you know, a significant amount of more money, right? They have the cruise industry that's coming here that can buy orchids. So th it's to take the technology, the know-how that Taiwan has, bring it down here, make it accessible to our businesses here to help stimulate them mm -hmm. and make them more competitive in our region. I think let's start with that. And I think that we could make st significant inroads. How do we develop a business sector that could make our tourism industry more competitive? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, for the time being, that is the industry that's generating the most foreign exchange. That is the industry that has the greatest potential to grow and that we have shown incredible opportunities to be able to compete in. Um, you know, I have to be honest with you. When we lost the, the level of airlift that we lost from the United States, mm -hmm. the automatic thing from an economist's point of view, capacity goes down, demand is, stays the same, prices are going to go up. And we did see that. Prices for airlift into St. Lucia to fly to Miami, fly to New York, has gone up considerably. But the demand for our product is so strong that they have paid the extra prices. I only hope that that is sustainable over a longer period of time. But for the time being, mm -hmm. the growth that we, any little growth that we've seen, when the, when, uh, when the states got very cold last year after the storms and everything else, we saw a huge spurt which went right all through the summer into St. Lucia. And that's despite the fact that you're paying almost three times more to fly to St. Lucia than you are to some of the other destinations. It tells you we've got a great product. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine if we were to develop a policy that could support that. And instead of it swimming upstream, it was now swimming up downstream. And that people felt that they were benefiting from the industry. And I think that that's the magic words. So there has to be a change in the dispensation in terms of how we feel about tourism, how tourism is managed, that everybody feels that they're part of it. But that is the industry that offers the, the, the greatest opportunity to grow. I think that there are some byproducts of our, our culture, um, particularly cocoa, that can be very successful. And if we're only producing now 30 tons, there's not, we were producing 500 tons. And if we now start seeing cocoa grow even more, what is that upper level in terms of what we can, we can potentially yield? So I want to remind our viewers, you can call in. Our number is on screen. Um, if you have any questions or comments uh, for our guest this evening, the political leader of the United Workers Party, Mr. Alan Shastney, um, we're talking about the importance of tourism. I want to tell us into crime. Um, you have a call. Good evening. You're on the air. 
Okay, we lost that call. Um, you made a statement, a um, very troubling statement, that under the same Social Labour Party government, crime increases. The United Nations um, issued a Caribbean Human Development Report in 2012 that says across the region over the last 12 years, save for Barbados and Suriname, all of the countries have had an increase in crime and is threatening to wipe out economies, um, especially since we're so dependent on tourism. It should be a concern not just for the government but for the opposition as well. Are we not making a mistake by politicizing crime? Well, I certainly, you know, when I was minister, I, I did it my best not to politicize crime and I'm certainly not trying to politicize it at this particular moment. But, mm -hmm. I mean, a fact is a fact. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, there there's some there's some significant policy changes I think that we need to in, 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 in to change. For instance, I have a great difficulty right now with the number of people that are on remand, mm -hmm. and even the age of some of those people. Should somebody who commits a crime at the age of 17, 18, go to Bordelais, when that person comes out, they've had no job, there's no savings, mm -hmm. and what are we teaching them in Bordelais? Versus if we had some kind of halfway house, where what they lost was the ability to go out at night. But we uh, caused them to get a job. We showed them how to get a job. We showed them how to save money. And that by the time they left this halfway house, that they have a life to go to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that we need to play more uh, 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 concern on those issues, and we need to be more humanitarian as solutions. And I think there are a lot of injustices that are taking place that we've got to be able to resolve. Okay, we have a call. Let's take that call. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi. Good evening, Mr. Chastney, Mr. Burton. Um, I've been listening to, um, especially like the last week or so, what's been being said about the government and all of the great things that they supposedly have done in the tenure. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, I, I look at things a little bit, see it a little bit differently. For the past two years, we've been subjected to a government whose ministers think it is okay for parliamentarians to cuss citizens whom they were sworn to represent, then turn around and imply that a mother who is a r rightly emotional and riled up when her child was abused, not just by her classmate, by that classmate's mother and treat her with disdain, not worthy of his empathy, I have a problem with that. I, I mean, I can't imagine, I didn't even think that I would see the day when, is it, Lucia, we have ministers of government sworn in parliamentarians who would adopt that kind of stance. We have a government who's Im whom immediately, in the very real sense of the word, immediately upon taking office broke its promise of better days by asking solutions to tie their waist. They reduced the subsidy on sugar, flour, rice, and increase the retail price of the consumer while making no provision for the middleman, the wholesaler, who for the most part make these commodities available to the smaller shops and bakeries, particularly in the south of, south of the island, where already the people are repressed. Mm -hmm. You know, the unemployment is it's at its highest rate in the south. Money is very scarce in the south. And these are some of the policies that w was enacted by our, gov our government. And the situation still has not been satisfactorily resolved. We have a government that has imposed VAT at a time and a rate that w when citizens can ill afford it. We have a 66% increase in water with a pending further increase next year, a pending increase in bus fares, a demand for price increase on bread, which one can't fault when you really think about it. When, the, when, you, when, when you, you, you factor the, the, the fact that the cost of the factors of production have increased for the bakers, we've seen an increase in social spending with no corresponding increase in revenue to help defray the cost of social spending. We have a reduction in the tax levied on fuel, yet we have an increase in the, fuel, the price of fuel. We have seen a reduction in scholarships. We have seen a reduction in cruise ship arrivals. And we have, we have ministers dismissing the coconut oil factory as being non-competitive, whereas we could develop a premium product to sell at a premium price. These are some of the things that are really concerning me. These are some of the things, and just that's just scratching the very surface. This is the tip of the iceberg for me. When I when I look at the last two years, when I look at when I assess the government's um, success or or the track record, I would say for the last two years. My question to you, Mr. Shastney, being a noted trouble troubleshooter, what are some of the things you would like to see in your party's blueprint for success? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, you know, obviously it's very articulate. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, in going around in St. Lucia, um, you're meeting a lot of people who are expressing a, a lot of disappointment. 
um, and, and are concerned. And we're going to be holding a public meeting in the boulevard um, on December 10th. And what we're going to be doing is at 5.30 is asking people to assemble at a point to do um, a, 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 a candle vigilance mm -hmm. um, walk um, to the boulevard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're asking people of all persuasions to come out because I think there's a lot of people who want to be able to express their, their concerns. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, this government has shown in the past that it's only when you stand up to it that policies change. And I think that we need to basically let the government know that we're all very unhappy with what's taking place. In terms of some, in terms of some of the immediate things that can be done right now, as I said to you, um, Antigua, Grenada, Barbados have all changed their incentives policies. That we've seen no investment come in to this country in the last two years. Mm -hmm. So the government needs to go back to the drawing board and figure out what it's going to do. And it needs to do that extremely fast. I think the decision to have taken off the tax for the airport was a ludicrous decision. We could have collected at least another $50 million since they've done it. And even if they didn't do anything, the fact that they were collecting that money would mean that when they went to do the project, they would have had to borrow less money. Mm -hmm. And they've got to get some of the infrastructural projects off the ground. I don't know why the Castries development has not gone. Um, you know, they've talked about the highway. I mean, when you t you're going to do a study on, about the possibility of closing George Charles, you cannot close George Charles Airport at minimum until you build the, the new highway. And even then, I don't think it makes sense to close it down. But at minimum, you can't close it to then. Why are you spending all these monies on these things? The idea of spending the additional money on foreign affairs, which has not yielded anything. So in terms of a blueprint, I mean, we did a pretty good job of going through all the issues. Improve your manufacturing capacity and, 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 and competitiveness. Improve your tourism. Start fixing up agriculture and making it more focused and helping your farmers now become better farmers and more efficient farmers. The idea of tai Taiwan, I think that Taiwan is a huge opportunity to bring in them here to help our businesses in terms of adopting some of our businesses and making us more efficient for our own markets. And there's a ticking time bomb. The ticking time bomb is what we call um, the, uh, um, the, 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 the new arrangement we have with the Europeans. Let's talk a little bit about that after I take the next call. Um, good evening, you're on the air. Hi, good evening. Hi. Um, Thanks for holding. Um, I have a few questions. Um, a on few? A, on a program, I, I, will, I will not mention the, 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 the name of the program, mm -hmm. a few, maybe last week, some, a caller um, did ask Mr. Shastny what, what um, in the two years um, the Liberal Party has been in power, mm -hmm. um, has he picked up any scandal? And he answered um, abuse of language, um, the bridge at Deville, that's in Soufre, mm -hmm. and uh, the three, the Bonte Bridge. I want him to tell me where the scandals in those three points that he made. And my fourth point is, um, Mr. Chastney was, well, he, he actually um, vied for the Soufre seat. Mm -hmm. And I can remember clearly he brought some investors to the coconut factory in Soufre. But when the district rep at the time, well, he's still a district rep, Mr. Harold Dalsa came up, the gate was shut on him. Right now he's sitting in the chair saying that what the copra factory can be. I couldn't at that time that he, he, he could have invited Mr. Dalsa and said, let us work together, let us put that together. But the gate was shut on him. Another point, I, I, I go through a trip advisor, I read, and there, there's a, a reply from a particular hotel, maybe he's a, a family hotel, but a guest um, was disappointed in the staff, I guess, communicated in Patwa. How could you tell a guest that is zero tolerance towards the staff um, communicating or conversing in Patwa at your hotel? Um, wouldn't it be better if you explain to the staff or, or upon arrival, you explain to the, to, to, the, sorry, to the guests that, yes, it is our second language or whatever it is. But for you to write this on TripAdvisor, it goes around the world. Persons, there are persons from different, you have French guests coming to this hotel. You have other persons, you go to other hotels, and there, there's a sign that will tell you they speak Spanish or whatever it is. Why couldn't that be done? And um, fourthly, well, I, I have some more points, but these points, I think, it could stay with him and he could answer this point for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.
Um, thank you very much for a, a very uh, detailed and great background. Um, so let's deal with uh, some of the issues right off the bat. In terms of, of, of corruption, mm -hmm. um, the issue with the DeVille Bridge is how could you have that there were a contract issued for two bridges, the Mocha Bridge and the DeVille Bridge, for four point something million dollars. They're approximately the same size. I would say, if you have anything, the DeVille Bridge is a bit bigger than the Mocha Bridge. Mm -hmm. But let's say they're the same size. So uh, that's $2.1 million for each one. Mm -hmm. And the DeVille Bridge, a contract had already been issued for $600,000. Okay? And the contract was issued, and the uh, Sugar Beach, the old Jealousy Hotel, had agreed to pay the $600,000. Right. The project after election stops. Nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. Next thing, there's a lot of pressure, and then you all of a sudden you hear there's going to be this new bridge going up, work is going to commence, and the contract is for $2.1 million. And it's the same design. Mm -hmm. So how can that be? How can that be? You have a situation with Grindberg right now, mm -hmm. um, where the Prime Minister signed a document without going to Cabinet, without going to Parliament, and uh, permission to mine was given, despite it was within the authority of the Governor General to do so. Mm -hmm. The Governor General has written to say that she doesn't know anything about it, right? That there's no explanation. And I also have a difficulty, because I think it's a, a major conflict of interest, and I thought the Prime Minister would have handled it better, considering that he's involved, to me that he should remove himself from handling that thing. My understanding is, is that his friend, Mr. Astafan, is one of the lawyers on the case. So here you have a situation where he's caused a problem and he's now using his friend's lawyers who are getting paid by the state to defend the country. And yet we've still gotten zero explanation as to what's taking place. You have the situation with Rochmel, mm -hmm. in which it was proven that, that he gave a guarantee without going to parliament, without going to cabinet, Okay? and that there was no reason for him to have paid the money. But he did. And all these things are incredibly documented. You have the NCA affair. So I was only responding at the time because, you know, for me, is the responding saying that, that we were um, equally guilty of some of the same issues. And I'm saying, okay, but well you came in promising better days. Mm -hmm. And the better days you said initially was not about economic better days, but it was about better governance. And how are you leading by example? Let's take our final call. Good evening, caller. You're on the air. Yes, good evening. Um, first, I would like to say, Mr. Chairman, good night. Uh, Mr. Shastney, welcome back. And I have a couple of questions for you, Mr. Shastney. But first, I would like to point out a couple of points, you know. Um, sometime back, I overheard over the media that um, the Prime Minister, which is um, Kenny Anthony, um, has taken $3 million EC uh, to put into Liyad, three million uh, which US, is approximately nine thousand plus EC dollars, no. million EC dollars. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what I don't understand is that so many young men and young women are idling on the highways and the byways, and this money could have been interjected into something to help the young men and the young women in Saint Lucia. Having said that, uh, presently uh, it's a shame to say that homosexuality, lesbianism is taking control over our country. Uh, Mr. Chastney, that's where you come in. If you was to be elected uh, mm -hmm. Prime Minister tomorrow morning, what would be the first thing you would do to help the young men and the young ladies in St. Lucia? This is question number one. Um, number two, uh, with the economy, uh, the economy is bleeding. Basically, if you have $100 and you break it, it's done. If you have five dollars, you buy a soft drink. It's done. Something is wrong in this place, and I know that you are not God. <laughs> Maybe you know who's speaking, but I'm not going to say my name. I choose not to say my name. I know you're not God, but I know there's something uh, you should be able to do uh, for the country. What would be your view? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think that um, we need to improve our education system. Uh -huh. um, I think that we need to improve the quality of our teachers and provide them with substantially better training than we presently do. I think that Sarathar do does a decent enough job. Yes, but sir. clearly when you look at um, the disparity between what other developing countries are doing and where we are, we need to make our people more productive. Um, I, I think that the nice step and leap are a great idea. I mean, you always need to have a program that's going to help 
capture people that are falling through the caps. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to have seen that being applied into an apprenticeship program. I mean, considering the amount of money, I mean, $3 million EC would go a long ways in helping the program I talked about in terms of training people to go and work in the cruise ships. Um, we need to improve agriculture and encourage more people to get back into the agricultural area, but it needs to be not done in a way in which we're subsidizing them. We need to help them in their training and their, their overall level of experience. And then fundamentally is we've got to turn our economy around. Uh, I think that the idea right now of, of reducing government's burden, yeah. but at the same time not causing investment to take place, is troublesome. And I think that we're going down a very slippery road. If, in fact, we continue to see the cost of living increase to the extent that you're talking about, sir, yeah. and people are going to want higher salaries. If they want higher salaries, the businesses are not in a position right now to do that because there's no growth. So all of a sudden, we end up may see an even higher um, uh, level of unemployment. And if government's response continues to be the way it is, which is that they're going to create the jobs, it's not government's job to create jobs themselves. You cannot take taxpayers' money mm -hmm. to pay somebody a money in which they're not paying taxes. What you want to do is to create the policies, give the support to the private sector, that you now have people working mm -hmm. and are paying taxes, and that they can go, that tax money should be going to cover health care, education, the police force, and the continuing growth of our infrastructure. That is where the money should be going to, not where government gets to play God and choose who gets the job and who does not get the job. We are creating a country of dependence, and that is our, a very, very sad situation for us right now. Yeah, but Mr. Shafner, if I may say, um, you find that if the government could have implemented something, whereas um, the young men or the young women of yesterday and of today um, could have gone back to school uh, to get a better education or a trade, for instance. Uh, let me let me exemplify something like the three million dollars U.S. Uh, Mr. Anthony is taking to interject into Liat. Why can't he take this money and say, look, let me put small program out there that the young man and the young... You see, my interest is in the young men and the young ladies here in St. Lucia because they are the next prime minister, they are the next doctor, they are the next lawyer, they are the next teacher. You know, and if we can implement something into our young people, because the, the country is going to stray, man, you know, it is going to stray. I, I, I mean. want to say that I agree with you, and that's why when I said is that I feel that the, the apprenticeship program Program, right? We yeah. should be getting young kids to be able to get jobs and businesses in which we can subsidize their salaries and allow them to learn a skill. Yes. And at the same time, buy time while we're growing the economy. But if we do all these things and we're not growing the economy, you're going to end up back where you began. Yes, we sir. have got to focus on, on growing the economy. And as I said to everyone, all the meetings we have, the meeting starts off very simply. What's the finish line? You know, once we agree on what that finish line is, we can then start discussing the how. Oh, we get that. Mm -hmm. So our objectives, we believe that anything that is less ambitious than growing, doubling the economy in a minimum of 10 years is, is doomed for failure. There's, there's no number scenario that I can see. And, you know, Sir Dwight has been saying that now for how many years? That the yes. economic growth of St. Lucia and of the OECS needs to be in the 7% range, not yes. in the 1.5% range. When we're only growing by 1.5%, we're actually declining uh, relative to the rest of the world. Yes. We need some significant growth here. And we need to get to the economies to a large enough size to handle the economies of scale. Because yes, the doing of business in St. Lucia, of maintaining roads, providing a health care service, mm -hmm. providing an education service, providing a proper police, a police force, all is going to require substantial monies. None of those services presently are on a world-class level. Yes. None of those services are at a level to cause St. Lucia to be c more competitive. Yes, so we have got to have confidence in those people, but it must be a parallel plan. This you do right. those things and you grow the economy. So true. Un unfortunately in St. Lucia, in a lot of quarters, Growth is a bad word. Yes, sir. Every time you talk about growth, everybody talks about environmental issues. Uh -huh. You know, I remember when I, when I was Minister of Tourism, people used to say I was anti-culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the most ridiculous statement I've heard because I'm a marketing person. In order to succeed in marketing, the first thing they teach you is product differentiation. Yeah. The one thing that differentiates St. Lucia's product is our culture. Mm -hmm. So I, would, I want to embrace our culture, and I want to be able to see our culture, culture grow and to be put on a pedestal 
Yes, sir. And provide the environment to allow that to be able to grow. Give yeah. our people the tools, and I know that we can do it. Now, I mean, I feel the pain of a lot of people in St. Lucia. I feel what people are going through right now, that you get out of bed in the morning and you do not know how you're going to face the day ahead. Yes. Where is the money going to come from? How am I going to feed my children? So true. I was telling a story on Sunday. I mean, I met a young man, right? And the, the guy was literally in tears to me. He said, I've had to resort to selling drugs. Yes, sir. And the difficulty for me, he said, is I go home and I have two young children. And what example am I selling for them? He says, uh -oh. fortunately for me, they're young enough, they don't understand what's going on. Yes. But I don't have a choice. And, and, mean, and I think that the government needs to be a bit more sympathetic to that. Yes, sir. Right? That it, 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 it may be all good and well to say that you're going to uh, better the finances of St. Lucia. But if it's going to cost of losing your, your society and losing your people, it's not worth it. Okay, thank you, Carla. One thing again, hello? Oh, thank you, Carla. We're out of time. I want to okay. thank you, Mr. Shasti, for being with us this evening. I want to thank you for viewing. It's our last program for the year, but I want to invite you to join Delia Dolor tomorrow uh, at 8 o'clock. Uh, that's 8.30, rather, for the Dolor Factor Live. We'll have the executive chef from Ladera here to show you how to do some amazing Christmas um, recipes. That's Nigel uh, Mitchell from Ladera. Also, we'll be on the program Anita Phillips and Ashnell St. Thomas from Courts. They'll be putting together a Courts wish list for Christmas. So. Uh, don't forget to join Dilia tomorrow and thank you again, Mr. Shasi, for being with us. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, we'll see you next year. Best luck for the new year. Yeah, you too, thanks. Thanks.